but Christine, we, we should we get underway? Yes, we should. We should. So um, welcome, everyone. So thank you for joining us today. It's really great to see so many people coming to um, listen to our presenters and to have such wonderful presenters talking to us today. So I'll just ask it. Um, so welcome to Silver Linings 5. Uh, what have classroom teachers learned during this time? Um, this forum allows us to connect with our fellow museum educators and public programmers to discuss the impact of COVID-19 and the Envy Committee are hoping to discover and suggest some positive ways for us all to move forward um, positively at this time. Um, if I just, if I could just ask people, please, if you're not speaking because it's a large group, if you could please put yourself on mute, and that will give us the opportunity to say the funny catchphrase um, at the right moment. Um, I also encourage you to submit questions, comments, ideas for other Silver Linings programs that we might run in the comments um, field. So we're going to monitor that through. So if you've got things that you would like to ask or, or suggest, um, please join in to that conversation. And we hope that that will also follow through to Facebook. Um, I can hear a blizzard. Um, so, um, the, this is being recorded. Um, if you could please mute your microphone in the, I think it was the bottom left or top right. I think it might have stayed on the bottom left of the overall screen. Um, if you could put your hands up to talk or um, put your comments in the, um, in the chat box, that would be great. Um, and I've already said that. So um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. And for me, this is the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to their spirits, ancestors, elders and community members past and present. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us today. And I invite you to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land you're on by posting their name in the shared chat window. Um, so I'm Christine Healy, I'm the president of ENVY, um, our facilitator for this, this particular um, Silver Linings is Pete Hoban, so thank you very much Pete, and he's been um, supported by Michelle Kiag, who unfortunately is an apology for today, and Alice Barnes. Um, the Zoom is being hosted by Celia Mallard, so thank you very much Celia, and um, we should get underway. Excellent. Look, uh, thanks so much, Christine, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, it's great to have over 40 participants with us this afternoon, and I'd like to particularly welcome those interstate guests that are with us. So, hi to Kate from Tasmania, Deb from Canberra, and Linda from New South Wales. Um, I'd also like to uh, shout out to the infamous Liz Suda, too, who actually uh, was instrumental in getting this program up this afternoon with us and also send our best wishes to Michelle Cagg, who's a, a bit unwell at the moment. Uh, but I believe she'll be listening, so get well soon, uh, Michelle. Uh, can I recognise that I'm coming to you from Wadawurrung land and I want to pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, can I also pay my respects to all the, uh, the teachers of Victoria who are doing a remarkable uh, job of teaching remotely once again. I'm in awe of their ability, their adaptability, their professionalism and their resilience. When we first thought of this topic a few months ago, we believed Victoria had come out of lockdown and remote learning was a thing of the past. Not so. Our title for today's, for today's program is the question, it's what have teachers learned from remote learning? While we are most interested in student outcomes, uh, we're also very interested in the teaching processes that, are, that get us there. So it might be better to call this session what have teachers learned from remote teaching and learning. Why are we interested in this? Because uh, we are in the business of delivering resources to schools and much of the, the resources that we deliver are delivered online. So if we can have the next slide, please, Christine. Today's program uh, is going to be divided into two. Our first half will be devoted to the authors of a very important and a very timely recent report from the Melbourne School of Education, Drs. Natasha Zabel, uh, Daniela Aquaro, uh, Kath Pern and Associate Press of, uh, Professor Wee Chiong Xia uh, interviewed 1,200 teachers from across Australia to, to gain a summary of their experiences of remote teaching. Their summary report is absolutely fascinating. 
Our second half will be devoted to three practicing teachers who will tell us what was good, what was bad, and what was interesting in their experience of remote teaching and learning. As I said before, I'm in awe of their skills and their adaptability. Uh, next slide, please. Excellent. <clears throat> we might expect a range of views about remote teaching and learning um, uh, from the positive, like this one, to the negative. This quote's a ripper. It, it comes from this report that we've been talking about. Um, and uh, it encapsulates what we're trying to look at this afternoon. And I particularly like the end question there. What can we do better and grow? N next slide, please. But while our series of events is called Silver Linings, it would be foolish of us to be too positive and to ignore some of the problems of keeping kids away from school. And I think this is a really important sort of quote as well. So, the next slide, please. Okay. These are the major focus points for this afternoon. We hope you'll feel free to use the chat facility to ask questions as we go along. And uh, these will be moderated by Alice Barnes and uh, she'll be asking questions for you at a certain time throughout the afternoon. Can I now hand, hand you over to Natasha Zabel, who might introduce a team from uh, Melbourne University. Natasha. Thank you, Peter. I'll just get my screen share. Uh, it's just saying that I can't start my screen share until the other person stops sharing. Thank you very much. There we go. Okay, can I just check that you can see the slide in full? Terrific. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today and we thank you for inviting us to share some of the results of our study. Um, the presenters today got myself, uh, Dr. Kath Pern will be presenting second. These are in order of uh, presentations. Associate Professor Wei Chiang Sia and Dr. Daniela Aquaro. Um, we came together at this very critical time to uh, learn more about teachers' experience and also the impact it was having on students' learning. And I think um, it's great to be here today because the educators working in the GLAM sector do very important work in supporting teachers and students. And it's so heartening that you're here today in this capacity to contribute to the education development and discourse in Australia surrounding the impact that the, the pandemic has had on how we work and study. Now, our survey was released on May 9. Uh, this was at quite an important time. So teachers had already spent some time engaging in remote learning. So remote learning, uh, you might remember, started on March 24. Uh, and students started, we had a staggered return back to schools around May 26, with students in prep grade one, two, VCE and VCAL students returning. And then the students in years three to 10 returned to school on June 9. Uh, and then, of course, you know what happened in Victoria, we're, we're back in um, remote learning at the moment. So the response to the move to a remote learning environment saw a rapid transition to online teaching and the adoption of new tools to ensure the continued education of students at all levels of our system. So we released the first survey during the first wave of remote learning and captured all the concerns and challenges and the emotions, and in some cases, quite extreme emotions experienced by teachers during this time it gave us a bit of a pulse check on the system. However, I think it's important, just like Peter mentioned earlier, um, that we have a very dedicated and hardworking, creative and resilient profession. And during this time, we saw some absolute teaching brilliance emerge within the new constraints and the physical distance that comes with remote learning. It also had an impact on things like collegiality uh, and working with children. So at the time, I thought it was a temporary measure, but now we also need to focus on our short term and our longer term strategies as a profession. And that includes the additional affordances that have been discovered as a result of this experience. So overall, we did have 1,200, over 1,200 respondents uh, at all levels of the education system. But today we'll be looking at the responses specifically from 300, over 350 primary teachers and 590 secondary teachers. Now the survey can be categorised into four key areas. So the first one was remote learning and these questions were really student focused. We wanted to know more about um, issues like accessibility, attendance, um, task completion um, and the standard of work. The second one was remote teaching, and this one really was um, teacher-focused. Teacher so again, we looked at things like accessibility and the use of tools, um, but also teacher skills, any professional development that they had been provided with in this shift, um, 
the impact it had on workload and general support. Um, beyond that, we also looked at opportunities and challenges presented by this uh, unique period of time. And then, of course, the impact on educational progress, social development, and emotional well-being. And you'll see in the report that I'll share in the comment section um, a little later that the teachers weren't so concerned about educational progress because they knew that good curriculum design would be able to catch students up. Although now, after a long, prolonged period of time, I'm not sure whether those results might look different. But teachers were certainly concerned about social development, and the most significant one of those was emotional well-being of students. And in fact, we had some comments about um, emotional well-being of staff. So I'll start by addressing some of the challenges that teachers had and we'll finish with the opportunities because I think that's what you're interested in as well in uh, your roles. So there are five key areas of challenge which, and these, these included issues related to health, safety and wellbeing. However, what I'll focus on today are just two of them. Uh, the one I'm showing now is focused on teaching and the other one was learning. I think the remote learning environment changed the fundamental activities that constitute effective teaching practice as we know it in complex school settings. So I think it's important to acknowledge the challenges, but you know, also to highlight that there was significant variability for teachers and students, depending on their personal circumstances, um, the, the collaborative nature and the collegiality they experienced, but also um, things like access, having a place to work, and also pushing through exhaustion uh, during this time. So it was tough for people. Um, teachers, their lives didn't stop. They still had to manage, uh, you know, try to get food for their families and organise their children's learning at home if they had families. Other people were living by themselves. So there are a whole, it's actually a very complex um, uh, situation overall. But if you can, on this slide, you see at the centre we are teaching and the responses were coded and each one of these bubbles uh, can actually be broken down into further categories. But I thought I'd put just the major focus areas of the things that, that, that found challenging. And that was the rapid policy changes and rapid policy decision making, both at the, the federal, the state, but also at, at the school level. Uh, recognition was an issue. Uh, curriculum, pedagogy, resourcing, communication, homework workload, professional development, classroom management and assessment feedback and monitoring. It changed the essence of everything that teachers had to do. And there wasn't one aspect that I could see in a teacher's role that wasn't impacted by this, this new way of working. We've got a few, um, I've just listed some quotes there. Um, one, that, that first one relates to communication systems with staff, lots of emails, um, decision making and teammates teamwork made it really difficult to work online. And I think um, when teachers have got so many emails and communications coming to them, um, we need to think about effective ways of communicating in this new environment that doesn't overload people. So how can we actually reduce um, the unnecessary communication and target what is quite critical? Um, there was a, the, the second quote there. Uh, actually, I, I've got to say, this was one of the most emotional analyses I've ever done. Uh, it was quite heart-wrenching in some cases. Uh, this is from a graduate who said, I just feel so isolated and alone. Um, not only are they, um, and I know with our graduate teachers, when they enter the profession, they do enter, a, a, they've been working towards this for years. Um, it's been a goal, they're passionate, and they've just been thrown into remote learning as well. So I think for our graduate teachers, there's an additional challenge there and they wouldn't have that you don't have the, the staff room conversations and the corridor conversations that you normally would have on site uh, and the last one was the professional development and I think there were some constraints here in terms of just the rapid shift from working in the school environment to the home environment and schools had to manage um, they were just trying to work out what programs they could use uh, and test a few of those out uh, let alone upskilling teachers uh, for this new way of working in terms of learning, teachers identified um, areas of student engagement. They were very concerned about at-risk students and uh, this period also exacerbated um, existing equity issues, um, but I think it also exposed some further equity issues. Um, they were concerned about support. Our VCE students are, are a very um, particular group within uh, the whole education system that teachers were particularly concerned about, and again, communication. Um, so, you know, our, we work in very social um, environments 
And that for the first quote there, there is also not a lot of joy in teaching when the one-on-one -on -one interactions and relationships aren't there. So I think as we've settled into the online environment, the way that we interact has had to change, but um, it, it is still very different to being in the moment and seeing how students respond. And I know some schools have even had policies where students can't turn on their videos uh, as part of their child safe approaches. And that's been a challenge as well because uh, all they're hearing is, is a voice uh, at the other end. The other issue was um, time, time and workload. So teaching online, actually takes a lot longer. And we know we've been doing this ourselves in initial teacher education. Uh, we've been trying to pair things back because we know it takes longer to, to communicate things in this mode. So um, teachers also pick this up. So some students pick up concepts really easily. Um, it's even difficult to get across even easy things, uh, even easy things across. Uh, supporting students is much more cumbersome. There is a sheer information overload, even for teachers. And there is a point where everyone just switches off. In class, we will do a lot of things that are fun to engage students. And I think, I actually think that's a really important point there. What can we do um, to the best of our ability to replicate those types of uh, engaging activities that we normally would have in the classroom in these online environments. And I have no doubt that the people that are, are listening in on this Zoom today would have some ideas in that area. So I think there's a real opportunity here in supporting teachers with resources that do increase student engagement in remote environments and creative ways of supporting interaction and communication, but also for professional development. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Wei Tiong, but um, there's just a few thoughts there for you. Thank you, Wei Tiong. I think it's me, Natasha. Uh, can you hear me, Natasha? Yes, sorry, I'd put myself on mute. Thank you, Kath. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, so uh, here are uh, two graphs showing the results from the survey, which asked you asked the participants to um, choose whether they strongly disagreed right through to the strongly agree. And the question they were answering was, I'm confident in my ability to deliver classes using online teaching. And I think this reflects how, um, I guess, teachers will give it a go. Um, while circumstances change, they, as Natasha said, they change very quickly. But uh, you'll find here, if we look at our primary teachers, uh, you can see there's certainly a majority that um, have agreed that they're confident to, to deliver classes online. And I suspect that's, and the same with the secondaries, not quite to the same extent, but I think it is about being a teacher. Whatever, whatever gets thrown at you, you will make it work. It may be difficult, and we certainly had comments where teachers were commenting about the amount of time it was taking, but um, they were confident that they could do it regardless despite the fact that um, things were tricky, they were trying to homeschool, they were trying to lessen the amount of content that they were putting up, but their approach was, yes, I, I am confident I can actually do that. Um, when, if we look at also just something related to that, about 78% of all teachers agreed to feeling well prepared and supported to work, move into that space. <clears throat> And that just happened to be 73% of primaries with 82% of secondaries feeling that they were supported in that ability for them to be confident. Um, next slide, Natasha. So, uh, no, the one before. So uh, here we're, we're looking at um, what our teachers felt about the amount of prof that they had been provided with professional development and while the numbers aren't, aren't huge, um, it, it still is that, again, it looks like that um, the teachers either agree or strong primary teachers, there was um, somewhere about 25 and another 22. So nearly 50% believed, or, or slightly over 50% believed in some form that they agreed that they'd been provided with professional development. Um, I guess my concern is about the ones who either strongly disagreed or disagreed that the, here they are trying to do their very best and there's probably there about a quarter of the primary teachers who felt that they hadn't been provided with professional development. 
If we look at the secondaries, uh, certainly more of those were feeling that they hadn't been provided with professional development, while there were others, um, as I said, about 50% again, who felt, yes, they'd been provided with professional development. I don't think they were trying to criticise the systems. I think this was just the reality that everything happened very, very quickly and there just wasn't time. I know there was the odd day or two days allowed by the um, where the schools were shut for students, but teachers were allowed to, to be at school to plan. But uh, again, we've learned, as Natasha said, by trying to do um, work do the same thing that we're converting uh, for adult students, it is very hard and you, you do it on the run. So I think while they may have had some initial professional development, I think they probably needed far more than they were receiving. But they certainly weren't critical. And I think this is, um, again, the resilience of teachers. I think now it's over to Wee Yong, Natasha. Thank you, uh, thanks, Ted. Um, we were also interested in, in finding out from the, uh, the teacher respondents um, what sort of online uh, programs or apps or platforms they were using. Um, you know, we often hear teachers talking about uh, or equating uh, remote teaching or online teaching with uh, Microsoft Teams or Microsoft Classroom. So really, I mean, you know, what's the repertoire? What is the range of uh, uh, resources that they have access to? So, uh, one of the questions in the questionnaire asked teachers, uh, if you are using online modes, uh, what are the tools uh, are you currently using? And this is one question, unlike uh, the previous one that you saw with Ted, this one question where they can actually have multiple answers. So as, as many of the tools that they are uh, using, uh, they can uh, actually indicate. So uh, right on the left-hand side of the, uh, uh, the table, you can see the, the choices. Um, teaching online classes, uh, real-time mode, um, and this would be uh, through systems like Skype or, uh, uh, or, or Zoom, uh, assigning pre-recorded videos, uh, video, video records of uh, lessons uh, that uh, are then paid back for the students to watch, uh, perhaps in synchronous, but whether these videos are made by the teachers themselves and recorded, or uh, these, are, these could be also videos or tutorials that are available online to YouTube, to the current academy, for example. Um, uh, the, uh, the fourth choice uh, was uh, whether you're using group class. Uh, uh, so uh, are you getting the students to do a task uh, with their group mates in breakout rooms, uh, using Google Docs perhaps and other resources, or do you, uh, are, are there interactive games and tasks that are available online to, to which students learn uh, from the games and, and from the task? Um, another choice, for the uh, teachers uh, to, to actually um, make a choice is whether they are actually using online teaching platforms, uh, a learning platform. So this would be quite similar to the LMS or the learning management systems, uh, which, which is quite different from Zoom and Skype. Because Zoom and Skype was originally, of course, uh, configured for the purpose of video conferencing and, 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 and uh, 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 communication. So whereas the uh, uh, learning management systems will have a much more facilities for uh, documents to be placed, uh, to be delivered, uh, discussion for rooms, uh, to be in an all in one space. So those are much more powerful uh, platforms and, and uh, apps. Um, do teachers also use uh, classroom organization programs to keep track of assignments, assessment tasks, grades, tests, or so on and so forth? Uh, and uh, lastly, do, uh, do teachers make use of uh, the online modes to uh, encourage students to, um, to make use of the home environment, to make use of the home garden, um, to, to look for resources, to look for uh, as a, as a stimulus for activities, uh, or even kitchen where cooking activities take place, measurement, measuring, uh, keeping track of processes and time and so on and so forth. And of course, there is a, there's a, a choice for others. So, um, so yes, yeah, you can see from the breakdown there, uh, um, there were about, um, uh, more than 8,000 responses. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, more than 3,000 responses, 3,400 responses from the um, about 900 teachers. So now, uh, if you look at the purpose for which these platforms and apps are configured for, so next slide, Natasha. Um, so if we break down by purpose, um, then you can see that some of these platforms, some of these uh, applications are for uh, teaching purposes, some are for the facilitation of tasks, 
and some are for uh, organizing the uh, the work of a teacher. Uh, and if you break this down and reconfigure and uh, group this by categories, you will have this pie chart that you will see in the next slide, uh, which very nicely show us that about 50% of the responses focuses on the applications that are focusing on teaching, so allowing teachers to facilitate their interactions with students. Uh, and about one third, uh, whether we're coming from primary schools or secondary schools, one third is uh, for uh, the uh, provision of getting the, the children and the students to engage in tasks, and uh, slightly less for organization. And this is quite pleasing to, to, uh, to know. I mean, because from our perspective, what this is telling us is that the teachers are actually using a variety of applications. I mean, looking at the responses, I mean, 3,400 responses from about 900 teachers. And the ratio of um, the, the teaching apps that are being used by the teacher is nearly one to three. So teachers are, are, are really looking at different ways in which they can actually teach, different modes they can actually teach. So it could be a, a combination of the learning management systems together with Zoom or together with, uh, with video uh, recording. So and this, is, uh, this is the sort of things that um, uh, showcases and demonstrates uh, the resourcefulness and the innovative uh, uh, ideas that teachers have to, to ensure that the lessons are as engaging uh, and as uh, uh, different uh, uh, from day to day for the students as possible. And then you have the one third of the uh, responses focusing on tasks, so which, are, which also gives a, a different sort of variety and rhythm to the day to day lessons. So it's not just about teaching, it's not just about um, uh, uh, interacting with students on a, 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 a exposition style. Or discussions, but also students are given opportunities to engage in tasks online. It could be asynchronous, and that gives further varieties and further um, uh, repertoire to the sort of um, uh, engagement, to the sort of uh, uh, interaction modes that, uh, that the students will have with their, their teachers. So for us, this is pretty comforting to know, uh, and we'll be, be happy to hear from the, uh, from the audience and, and, and from everyone here uh, what some of these personal experiences might look like. Over to you, uh, Daniela. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to present a very broad overview of what the opportunities were. Um, obviously, on the back of what Wei Tiong has said, um, just some, some um, a snapshot of five categories that we've identified. So the first is um, student engagement. So teachers reported that engagement has um, improved for some students. So there was a greater focus on schoolwork without the distractions of um, the classroom. Um, students were more likely to seek assistance uh, where they may have avoided it in the classroom. Uh, this this um, transition to online and remote teaching was particularly beneficial in engaging students who found coming to school um, challenging. Uh, there was an increase in engagement from students who have significant behavioural problems in the classroom, so they weren't sort of bouncing off one another, where that is typically the case in, in a uh, classroom setting. Um, teachers also reported that there was an increase in independent learning amongst some students, um, and that really manifested through better organisational skills, time management, um, so an improvement there. Um, and I, I think, um, broadly speaking, the opportunities that were outlined by teachers in terms of student engagement were that um, the, the period really allowed students to explore skills um, uh, around self-managing, collaborating, um, thinking, communicating, researching and inquiring. So it really did let some students shine um, in that period of time. There's also, and I think what we're seeing across the media and in many forums, um, and partly what's happening today, is trying to understand what all of this means for us when we, when we think about education and we think about the curriculum um, and what has this taught us about moving forward. And, and certainly, I think one of the very big things that this whole experience has taught us and what became very clear for us in the research was that um, teachers started to rethink the curriculum and they really started to really um, think about and drill down to what is essential learning. 
And I, I think, you know, there are many discussions in many areas about, well, you know, we talk, often talk about the crowded curriculum. Are we doing too much? Are we trying to cover too much? What are the essential skills? What are the essential outcomes that we're looking for? And really sort of trying to pair it back and think about that. And, and that was something that teachers um, had to do in this space. Um, online processes worked well in the classroom in freeing teachers up so that they could work with groups and individuals. If you think about the nature of you know, online learning and if you're using um, uh, grouping, Zoom rooms, that sort of a thing, you really have the ability to sort of blink yourself in and into different um, spaces very, very quickly to see how kids are getting on in that space. Um, also, uh, teachers really starting to think about how flipped learning could be used moving forward, how it could be used to do some preparation work um, before kids come to class. So thinking about that where perhaps teachers may have been hesitant to really think about um, flipped learning in, in the past. Um, one of the other areas was just the, the pace at which kids can learn when you provide things online. You really do give, give kids the option to accelerate or you give kids the option to really go over things if they need to go over things. When you've got material recorded, when you've got material that's available for them, they have the ability to do that. So that really helps teachers think about wh what does this mean for my practice moving forward. Um, feedback was also uh, another area, very fast tailored feedback um, in, in this space. Um, and I think uh, one of the big things was the, the great flexibility that teachers have when it comes to uh, online learning. Um, and, and that was something that was also mentioned. Um, parents and carers, there, there were some comments made here about um, greater communication with parents and carers about their child's learning. Um, teachers developed positive and authentic partnerships with parents where this may not have been possible in the past, particularly with parents that are working. Um, uh, all of a sudden, you know, parents are there, they're watching their kids. Um, one of the big things that did come up was uh, that parents and carers did become more involved and more aware of their child's education. Um, their child's abilities, their child's limitations, and that is, you know, that is a really good thing. Um, and, um, and so that awareness of, of strengths and challenges. Another area that came up was staff collegiality and collaboration. The increase, uh, uh, this actually increased collaborative working amongst staff, where this may not have been happening before. People that were typically used to working in silos were um, finding themselves sharing their expertise. Um, and it really did demand that people share their expertise because, uh, because everybody was really uh, desperate to learn and to understand uh, what they could do to make their learning as uh, effective as possible, their teaching rather as effective as possible. Um, we also saw the expansion of education networks. So teachers were not only just using um, the expertise within their school, but we were, we were sort of seeing um, the development of networks across schools. So, you know, you may have had independent, Catholic and government systems working together in particular areas uh, where that might not necessarily uh, be the case in your normal, you know, business as usual um, practice that we have. So collaboration about sharing resources, um, and just a collegiate way of working, um, sharing the load and supporting students, I think was very much the focus. The other big thing was teacher proficiency. I think we, we can all say that um, uh, this forced shift has really um, forced many of us out of our comfort zones. And um, for many educators that were very hesitant to move to online, very hesitant about uh, the possibilities of online, all of a sudden they really have become uh, um, very accustomed to teaching online, but also very accustomed to uh, what resources and, and supports are available. And, you know, case in point, all of the incredible resources that your um, organisations put up 
have become um, essential for teachers. So a greater awareness of the range of resources and their use in their teaching, increased ability in digital um, technologies, and just a better range of, of teaching um, generally that um, has been experienced. Um, and I think that's that for that slide. Um, there, there was another slide just with a couple of um, comments. So um, we're very capable educators, have done a remarkable job of supporting our students during an, um, during an unprecedented time. This shall strengthen our relationships with students and parents and have greater insight and appreciation of the role we play in their child's life. Um, the next one there, I believe that there will be many opportunities to challenge the many rigid practices of teaching Sorry, I have to move something out of the way, um, which haven't changed for years. It's a great opportunity for us to look at education as a whole and ask ourselves what we truly value in education, what we're doing well and what we can do better and, you know, and how we can grow. So that's fantastic. And the final quote there, providing students with more control over when they learn has been a real bonus for some in developing their time management and I'd like that to continue. Mm. So I think the next slide is just a slide over to questions and I'm not sure how um, you um, want to manage that. We're running pretty uh, tight on time here. So Alice, I don't know if you've been following the chat at all. Is there, there one question, quick question that we could do, Alice, here? Yeah? Are you with us, Alice? Okay, I can't find Alice. <laughs> Can I say that there is one question that I was following there, and um, I understand that you're, you're going to be doing another study with teachers as well. And the question from um, some of our participants is, you know, what about online excursions? Have teachers been using them, and how are they um, how are they uh, uh, rating them? I suppose. And so I wonder, Natasha, if that's something you might be able to include in your next um, interview with teachers. Um, Pete, we did have um, some questions about how teachers valued or appreciated the types of resources that we were creating and if online excursions kind of popped up at all in, in research. Uh, yes, online excursions hasn't popped up in our research, but um, because I, I'm the coordinator of the humanities at the university, we have actually uh, sent our students out to um, contact various organisations because we have an excursions expo. So in fact, I've had a little bit of insight into the type of work that's being done uh, in the virtual excursion space. Um, and personally, uh, even though we haven't um, done any research in this area, I think you've done an extraordinary job in connecting students um, to uh, these venues that they can't physically attend at the moment. And the potential for that is that, you know, there are so many locations all over the world that our, we, we could never take our students to. We are limited within, you know, one, 200 kilometres of our school site, you know, if we are going to, especially Sovereign Hill where you have the overnight stays and things like that. But um, I think there's huge potential there. And uh, even now with things like virtual reality technology, uh, we can take students to ancient Rome in our classrooms or from their home environment. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity to expand our curriculum and resources and the experiences we can, uh, that students can access without actually leaving the classroom site. And that's something I think we should take with us beyond remote learning. Yeah, well, maybe that's something that we can talk to you about another time, doing some research in that area. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm. thank you. Look, thank you so much. Uh, it's apparent we didn't leave enough time. Um, and I want to thank you for your brevity as well. But uh, what a great presentation. Uh, some really um, interesting insights there that we could go ahead with. But uh, thank you for your generosity, um, the people from Melbourne University. So can we now move on to our next group? And can I just ask, we've got three teachers. Alison Luff, are you here with us? I'm not sure if Alison is with us. No, I, I am, can't. I'm here. Well, good I'm on. here, hello. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alison, Nicole. Very good, all right. So we now have three teachers uh, who are going to present with us. Um, and uh, we've asked these teachers to provide their professional observations for remote um, learning and teaching. Um, all three are primary school teachers, which I think is probably a good thing. I'm not sure that we have the time uh, to take in the whole primary secondary experience today, and I think it would blow our heads up if we tried. 
Um, we've not sought the permission of their schools to talk to us, uh, so we won't divulge their school names unless they're prepared to, unless they've got permission. But we're very interested in their own um, professional observations. So Alison Luck was the principal in a, a state school in South East Melbourne. And Alison, just very quickly, I believe you've just walked into a new role in the middle of COVID crisis, have you? <laughs> yeah, I started here uh, at the start of term two. So I'm happy to share, I'm at uh, Waverley Meadows Primary School in Wheelers Hill. Okay. Um, we're a small school of about 168 students. So um, it was interesting walking in and then having no, no one on site. <laughs> I can imagine it must meet, be. and then I met all the kids for three weeks, and then they were gone again. So it's um, it's been an interesting time, that's for sure. And the uh, switch to remote learning um, has been something that I feel like we've all had our speedy Gonzales legs on, yeah. running, running, but not moving, you know, very far to start with. But definitely in the swing of things now. Excellent. Can I also introduce Craig uh, Kenner, who's a year three teacher at Independence School in South East Melbourne. And Craig, I think you'd probably describe yours as a very commun community minded school. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my school's called Woodley. Um, it's a small school in the southeastern suburbs. We're made up of three campuses. So it's actually a F2 year 12 um, school, but we have two junior campuses and one senior. Um, and yeah, very community, very, um, we have a nature-based pedagogy that runs very strong, strongly through our curriculum. Fantastic. And our third uh, presenter is Kari O'Gorman, and Kari drives a mark van that provides programs for five regional primary schools west of Melbourne. And, and Kari, you've had a real interesting experience because you're dealing with a whole pile of different platforms, aren't you, for these, these schools? Yeah, so um, each school um, decided on a particular platform. I think some of them just sort of uh, rushed that decision and, and grabbed whichever one um, they, they saw first. And so I am working on a different platform every day to deliver lessons and uh, as well as trying to keep kids engaged, trying to keep them interested in um, particularly in uh, books and literacy. Uh, but by doing that, I'm uh, trying to sort of expand their idea of what a library is into um, things like it's a, it's a place where you can learn new skills as well. So we've um, been working on building our skill set, uh, life skills, basically. So yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> Uh, sort of uh, literacy clubs and things as well, haven't you? Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so look, I'm going to ask you what was bad, then what was good, and then anything that you found interesting, and we'll get you to each respond to those. But I'll also, you know, um, invite participants to actually put up some questions as well. So can we start off with you, Alison? We're going to start with the negatives and go to the positives. What were the bad things about the remote learning, apart from the fact that you, you landed in a new school and didn't? <laughs> and um, had... Look, definitely just that lack of connection. Kids all of a sudden lost that connection that they had with their peers, the ability to learn collaboratively, um, the ability to learn face-to-face -face, you know, with their teacher, the whole social aspect of school, which I think is sometimes forgotten and lost. Um, that was definitely the biggest downside of it and teachers having to learn how to um, plan, collaborate and be resourceful from different locations where they weren't all able to be together. Mm. Uh, definitely the most challenging. Now, I found it really interesting in the chat before that a number of people were saying that, you know, face-to-face uh, -face sort of thing is very important in engaging learning in kids. And so missing that would be very difficult. So, yeah, yeah. You, you, there's so many cues that, you know, you get from students when you, you can read their expressions, you can read the sounds they make, uh, you know, when they get something, when they don't, when you need to take a lesson in a different direction. You don't get that from um, online so much. And it's the same, you know, the other way too. The, the kids don't pick up subtleties in uh, teachers' um, voices and and body movements and things when they're teaching when it's on a screen. Yeah. So Craig, what have been the difficulties or the, the worst part for you? Um, well, to go to school, you know? <laughs> that's it. That's been a huge learning curve in so many ways. Um, I feel like we've been in the learning pit ourselves. Um, look, the new experiences, the new technology, the, um, the lack of access to students, as Alison was saying, um, when you sort of hear that crack in the voice or um, something like that and you can't sort of be there to intervene 
Um, also that disconnect, if they were having a tough time with something and switch off, you've got nowhere to go. You can't really connect with them again. If they're no longer in a video call or something like that, you've lost your access. Um, I was nodding all through the presenters um, from Melbourne University. I was just like, yes, you've really captured the, the challenges that we've been facing. So it's been a real journey. Um, the only other thing I'd probably add is just to, yeah, that the slow process it is of explaining anything. So if we have a question, you know, what used to be a really quick answer, or I could quickly jot something on a piece of paper, it becomes a process of formulating a written response, perhaps doing a screen recording and then sending it off and waiting for a reply. It is that that trans information has slowed down so dramatically and it's yeah, more than, I don't know, 10 times the amount of workload um, to be able to get some simple points across um, sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, I found that comment that was made earlier about the loss of engagement in kids, you know, um, have you found there's been a loss of engagement? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. And, you know, we've got, um, we're very lucky. We've got a really high attendance. Um, but, you know, you're still having to um, engage constantly and reimagine how you're doing things. Um, after the first round of CLP, um, I went back to the drawing board. Um, sorry, when I said CLP, the first um, lockdown, um, I went back to the drawing board and I was like, if I did the same thing again, they would not appreciate it. They would not um, be engaged. We needed to do something different and switching it up has become an almost fortnightly thing where we change the platforms, we change the presentation, the design of our tasks. Um, got to constantly keep it new and interesting. We've got to compete with YouTube and Netflix and Roblox. We've got stiff competition, so we have to keep it as engaging and accessible as possible. <laughs> So Kari, what's been the, the difficulties for you? Uh, for me personally, it has been the jumping around with the platforms. Um, however, there's also been within that um, some of the students finding, you know, students who are going to find ways to muck around in the class will find them even in these digital um, zones. So I've had, uh, you know, some students in, until I learned how to turn off the chat system, there'd be a little bit of bullying here and there, which I could see, and they, I don't know if they realised I could see. Um, and uh, and then there's, you know, doing silly things with the camera, with flipping it upside down or putting on a background thing, or um, it's helped to have a, a, an education assistant in the space with me to, to, to catch some of those um, antics out. But uh, yeah, they, they've been very imaginative, even changing their name all the time um, to, to random things to try to um, grab some attention that way or to put a message out to their friends that way since I've turned the chat off. So yeah, lots of imaginative <laughs> antics that the kids are coming up with just the same as they would in a classroom, but they've got a new, a new platform to, to, to be silly in, so. <laughs> you know, I heard the, the story about kids just putting their pictures up and then going outside to play, you know, and they're teaching <laughs> and going, you know, I thought that was a rip. <laughs> um, can we yeah. now turn the light on to, you know, very quickly, what are the, the, the joys? What are the good things that have happened? Um, so, Alison, are there any silver linings? Um, look, I, I would never want to move to being always uh, remote. But in terms of um, some of the things that we've learned, they're definitely things that are going to come back into the classroom as well. So the, um, the independence of the students, for one, they've really um, taken off in terms of learner agency, you know, being able to um, choose what direction they want to go and how they're going to present their work to their teachers. Um, it's just amazing. I mean, they'll be able to come back and, and teach us so many more things that they've learned um, than, you know, than what perhaps they would have had they been at school. So that's got to definitely be a huge positive. Um, and when we come back, we'll be still utilising things like Google Classroom so that, you know, some kids can go off and perhaps watch a tutorial that a teacher's done um, to extend some kids or for an intervention group while they're working with, you know, a, a different group of kids. So that I think there'll be a lot less of um, that busy work that, you know, is sometimes still seen in schools when the teacher is just so busy focusing in on, you know, a certain group of students um, and they just can't be there with everyone at once. 
but the rest of the grade will be able to then access um, something via the technologies that we've now learned how to use. Thanks. Craig, what are the positives for you? Um, I'm very lucky. I'm in a school that um, was very quick to organise a really good structure for operating remotely. Um, so they were so quick in establishing that we were able to sort of land on our feet pretty quickly. So that was um, something that was so good. We really felt supported um, from our school administration and also just the way they set it up. Um, look, as uh, Natasha and Catherine and Daniela said, the, the feedback, the instant responses that you're able to provide to students that's really specific and individual to them. Um, the cross-campus collaboration. Um, you know, I'm teaching year three at the moment. They're really great, but they've got a lot to say and they're very quick on the keyboard and um, they're still so enthusiastic. So you've got this um, so much uh, information to process that we needed teams and now I'm operating so closely with the year three teachers at other schools and um, on my other campus. Um, so that connection has been really phenomenal. Um, and differentiation, I think that's the other one. The ability to um, cater more to the needs of your students, um, providing different ways for them to respond. I think I could never go back into a classroom and tell the students how they have to give me their answer. I'm going to give them the question and the way that they answer is going to have to be um, up to them. And I've had answers from students in video form, song form, poetry, um, uh, Minecraft. Uh, I had that for today for a lesson arrays um, in multiplication. I got a Minecraft village that was in an array. Um, and, you know, it has really opened up to these other possibilities. And I think that's something we're going to have to consider when we get back into the classroom. That's fantastic. Uh, Kari, how about your situation? Um, for me, it's been good to, um, to really form those connections with the kids between home and school. So, um, you know, getting to know, you know, they, they, where they can feel they can share something about home and something, you know, bring that back into school. So, for example, I had a boy um, who had selective muteness. Um, for, he's in prep. He just didn't talk at all through term one um, and no teacher had heard him speak. Um, and so, um, but after working with him online and his parents being in the back background and his siblings he sort of developed a trust with us and he started to talk so that when we went back to school he actually spoke to us um, for the first time so that was that was fantastic to hear his voice and and finally have that connection with him and I believe that's to do with the fact that he could see us online he was in a safe environment at home and he um, and he felt that he could then make that connection back at school with us um, so that was really good I've also enjoyed the multi-school aspect so I've run some sessions that are optional for kids to join into if they want to have interaction with kids from other schools and they have really enjoyed that especially the kids who live very very regionally and they haven't um, had that connection with kids at all outside maybe the three other kids that go to their school so um, that's been really good to to have those sessions and uh, also, the, when kids have come back to school, um, this, one of my schools has a lot more of a bullying, but the um, coming back into the classroom, they were a lot more respectful of each other, much more appreciative of each other's company again. And uh, it was almost like they were able to wipe the slate clean a bit with some of the issues from before and really longed for that, um, that group connection. So we did a lot more group games and songs and activities so that they could really um, venture into that. So, I've really found that they weren't being more as individualistic as they had been prior to the lockdown. So, yeah, I hope that continues. <laughs> They're all fascinating answers. And, you know, it, it sort of gets me like how real teachers always refer to kids all the time and how much it, yeah, answers really individual <laughs> kids and how they're handling things. Um, I just want to sort of throw it open at the moment. If, is there anything interesting, you know, that's not necessarily good or bad? And, and, and you know, is there anything that you've found just interesting. And I also want to throw it open to questions from the floor at the moment. So I think Alison's back online. She, uh, Alice, sorry, Barnes is back online. So she might be able to, to uh, um, moderate that for us. So can I throw it open to all three of you? What was interesting? Um, for me, I, I was really um, amazed how many of my teachers said their kids that tended to be withdrawn in the classroom were the ones that seemed more confident online. Oh. So having that buffer of the screen in front of them um, and 
feeling like they, not everyone maybe was looking at them or, um, I don't know, it just didn't seem as scary to them for some reason. They seemed more engaged. It really suited them a lot, a lot more. And then on the opposite hand, some of the kids that might have been, you know, loud, I was interested in listening before about, you know, the, the kids that will find a way to muck around will still muck around online. For us, not so much. Those kids tended to be a lot quieter. They didn't have that um, that audience, perhaps, that they would normally have. So they tended to, to um, yeah, to, to stay quiet. Yeah. I think one thing we'd um, love to be able to take back into the classroom would be the mute all button. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, we, if there's some way that we can um, have that organised, that would be just fantastic. Um, it's certainly been uh, a different thing. But yeah, that turn taking um, has been interesting with when they're speaking, um, just as it is with adults as well, um, you know, popping your hand up to say something. Um, we do have those students who get intimidated by that. They have a whole screen or class of people. Um, they can get quite nervous. And so I found um, there are certain um, students who, who do need that smaller group and um, chance to be able to speak as well. That's something else that's been interesting to note. The, the ones that are fully confident to speak in front of the class, they do, and the, they, they get regular um, air, but um, it doesn't suit everyone. And we do keep that in mind even having their cameras on uh, can be very nerve wracking for uh, especially the little ones. Yeah. Kari? Um, so what was the question again? <laughs> Just to repeat what, that. Was, what was the most interesting thing that has come out of remote learning for you? Um, the interesting thing I think for me is just the willingness um, of, of the students to adapt and, and how um, they they have been so enthusiastic to adapt, and uh, and then there's been also the kids who've uh, who may have felt that they weren't confident at some things have actually really shined. So I've had a session with the um, where the kids are allowed to read to me um, if they want to, and it's it's a small group session, and kids who would not normally speak up at all have taken that opportunity and said, okay, I want to read a book to you, and they've read it to me and a and a couple of small. Um, you know, another, another group of kids that they don't even know sometimes because it's a multi-school session and they're just um, willing to, to adapt to new things. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, Alice, are you with us? I am, yep. I Did dropped you? out temporarily. Look, I think the main question that's come up in the chat that so far hasn't been addressed by the Melbourne Uni people or our um, wonderful generous teachers here is about um, the use of cultural organization virtual excursions and resources do, do any of the three teachers have experience making use of them between March yeah. and yeah um, yes um, I've been very fortunate um, uh, a little while back uh, amongst the emails um, my colleague and I did notice one from the Royal Botanical Gardens and uh, there was something about it that captured our eye and it was just a passage which sort of said um, there's a lot going on at the moment but we'd love to be able to cater something for you and your school so if you've got an inquiry unit that you're running at the moment or an integrated unit that you'd like some support for um, they're really fantastic they said they'll customize it to suit the school so we got in contact and they were able to put together a program for us that was just fantastic. Um, so we did an incursion. So we got the two campuses together, which was really lovely. They liked being all together um, virtually. It was really comfortable for them. Um, they were pretty used to being in Zoom meetings and that sort of thing by now. And um, our presenters were fabulous. They took us through a whole lot of content, um, videos and um, photos and told stories about what they um, have at the Royal Botanical Gardens and what what was connected to our unit of study and the follow-up was great too at the end they um, set us up with a whole heap of resources that would further support our unit and I think it's that customization that means that even though we have access to a whole range of museums around the world we're kind of bombarded by that uh, plethora like the, suddenly every single place is seeming to open up for 3d tours but it's like where do we go and which ones um, but someone 
But once it actually connected to us and that the kids could go visit afterwards um, when they were able to, um, and that was so familiar to them, that was what was special and that's what they were interested in. So that was really lovely. Excellent, Craig. I, I think you can expect a few few more letters saying there's a lot going on, but we'd like to help. <laughs> <laughs> but you've given us the key to get in, you know. So, um, look, I'm aware of the fact that we've uh, got to our, our five o'clock time slot, but I believe we can go on for a little bit longer. But I'd like to um, um, uh, just say, Phil, uh, to our participants, feel free to drop off if you want to at this stage, you know. Uh, but we may go on just for a little bit longer, Christine. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, can I just add in about the excursions that um, I, one of the schools I was at this year, they wanted me to do citizenship education with the kids. They only had three seniors, so grade five and six kids. And, uh, and I asked earlier in the year before all of the COVID stuff happened, if I could take the children to um, Parliament House in Melbourne. And, uh, and they, they basically said no, um, because it, it'll cost too much. Um, and we don't have the staff to, to just bring um, that, just the three kids, we'd have to bring the whole school. And they had all these reasons why they couldn't um, do it. But then of course, when this all happened, uh, and the Parliament House put an email out saying, would you would you like to have an incursion um, at your school? And that was a lot easier. It meant that we could afford to do it, which we would not have normally been able to do. So the kids were able to see inside Parliament House and, and have the, the question answer time and all of that sort of thing, which gave them that experience. Um, and we also had a quick look through the pyramids of Egypt, which we probably wouldn't have been able to either. Um, so that was another um, topic, but yeah, going and, and using that um, VR technology to have a look right inside the pyramids was quite interesting too. So. Um, yeah, there's, it's definitely a thing to, especially for regional schools or rural schools who can't go into Melbourne very often and, uh, and see, see stuff that they wouldn't normally be able to see. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I've got a question for all three of you. Um, are you more interested in like online excursions and incursions or, you know, our resources that, that we produce, are they enough, you know? I think the um, the actual setting it up as a as an incursion sounds more exciting. It sounds like they they're really going somewhere, and um, there's an appointment. There's someone there to interact and answer their questions, and uh, mm -hmm. and really feel as though they're they're part of something bigger, um, rather than just the information is probably better. Maybe if they go hand in hand would be really good. Yeah, I think for me uh, the ability to to do a lot more excursions than you normally would have. Because in the past, you know, traditionally you're kind of constrained by how much the parents can pay in order for you to attend, well, in a um, government school, um, how many excursions you can actually go on. So you have to kind of choose between, you know, should we go to this place or this place or this place and which one suits, you know, better, um, which one's cost effective, which one has the best resources aligned um, and those sorts of things. Whereas now there won't be the need to choose. I mean, yes, go, going out on an excursion is absolutely fantastic, but you'll also be able to, you know, perhaps visit somewhere else virtually, which will only enhance the kids' knowledge and give them uh, some other things to be able to actually start comparing when they're doing their, um, their units of study. The, the next question, Alison, is uh, would you be prepared to pay for those virtual excursions? Well, for me, I think... Um, the what what the value for money is you know is in the the learning experience so absolutely um the saving for us as a school is always on the transport it's mm. the buses it's the buses that cost so much money um it's the same when we go to camp you know it's really it's the cost of transport um that's the killer and that's what often um makes it impossible especially like someone said before you know for kids that are out in rural schools to be able to you know um, get right into the middle of the city uh, virtually that's fantastic and then it's the same for those kids in the city to be able to go somewhere you know either in another country or another state or you know to go um, to Canberra mm -hmm. you know just to, instead of traveling eight hours on a bus that's going to cost a fortune you, you, you could travel there virtually and for me I think that's a great opportunity. Um, Alice, how are we going with questions? I've got a million, but... Uh... Oh, look, you've basically asked the other ones that connected to this topic. 
um, there's nothing else that jumps out. I think Daniela had her hand up to ask a question. I uh, just it was just a, a comment and I suppose just a contribution to the discussion that's that's um, you know unfolding at the moment. I think there is a really great opportunity um, for uh, you know for organisations um, that are represented here in this forum to really think about. Um, you know, the, the possibility of not having camps, the possibility of not having um, excursions. And I'm sure you've been thinking about this already, but uh, I suppose I've been privy to some conversations around what do we do? What do we offer um, students? How, you know, how can we put something together? How can we, um, you know, who's going to do this work for us? So I think, you know, it's just about sort of matching a desire um, and clearly uh, a willingness and the ability to offer something with you know those people those schools that um, that are that are looking so I, I from what I'm hearing at the moment um, there's definitely a desire and there is a need um, because you know clearly this could be longer than what we think um, it's not you know we're not talking about coming to the end of the year and then everything resumes um, normality again. Um, so, it, you know, it, it may be that we are looking at 2021 where we have to consider um, other options. So I think, I think it's exciting. It's just, you know, just a bit of work in trying to understand what it looks like. And I think one would expect to have to pay for, um, for what's being offered. I think that, you know, like schools would normally do that, um, that that would be an expectation, but that's just, I suppose, my opinion. Mm. Um, I think there's been a bit said tonight about uh, student engagement and Craig, I take your point about, you know, uh, being repetitious in what you, you're producing for your kids and trying to do something different, you know, and, uh, and, and trying to engage them. And I, I wonder if that's a hole that we could actually fit and, and, and by creating some of these online type of excursions. Um, um, sorry, Craig, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, uh, I saw the other day, Sammy J, um, uh, he put together a uh, series called Missing Moments, where he's trying to mm, sort of capture um, things that people can no longer do in Melbourne, um, like worldwide trips and that sort of thing. But he did a program where he ran a year five, six camp in a radio show, um, a year six camp uh, to Canberra. Yeah. And he did one of those and he acted out the whole script. and. It's something that we sort of do. We're, they're missing these moments and experiences. We're planning now how we could run a virtual camp ourselves. In America, they're running um, summer school um, activities, all virtually done and things like that, and summer camps. Um, at the moment, we're filming bits and pieces for our Sovereign Hill experience. Now, we can't go to the costume schools, which is devastating. It was my favourite experience last year. It was just such a wonderful um, camp and it's such a lovely experience but we're seeing saying how can we recreate some of those special moments and learning experiences in the classroom and um you know there is so much space for that and the kids love it they, they're so engaged um they're calling us sir and ma'am and they're um writing in calligraphy and they're doing everything they can to be able to join in they want to be part of it as well fantastic um does anyone else have any other really burning questions or comments before we wrap up? Because I'm um, very cognizant of time now. There is one sort of follow on question that's emerging from the chat. Um, it sounds like there's a real interest from schools based on what these three teachers are telling us um, in continuing these virtual excursions long term, even when we can resume visiting places in person. Would that be accurate? Yes. Yep. Fantastic. Very succinct answer. Well done. <laughs> Look, can I um, sincerely thank you for your generosity in being involved today, uh, both people from Melbourne Uni and also our three teachers as well. And I'd like everyone to give them a really virtual round of applause. That'd be fantastic if you could. Yeah, that one. Excellent. That's the, um, the, the way to go. Look, um, we're going to finish now. Um, I'll hand over to Christine in a second. We've got the chat room still happening. So, for the participants, I suppose one of the things that we'd really like you to, to reflect on is what are, perhaps what are you taking away from today's um, uh, uh, presentation, but also 
what are your interests? What else would you like um, uh, Envy to do? If you've got any other questions you'd like us to sort of present on. So on that basis, I'd like, now like to hand over to Christine. Well, thank you very much, Pete. Um, and thank you very, very much to all of the speakers that we had come along today um, for presenting um, your research and your work. It was really interesting to hear from you. So um, bravo. And thank you to everyone else for coming along and joining in on these conversations and asking the questions and um, and supporting us as well. So um, have, you know, you can follow us on our blog. You can see us on Facebook. Um, we're on Twitter. Um, there's lots of ways that you can connect with us and the work that we're doing. And um, we'll be running another Silver Linings. I think we've got two more lined up for the rest of the year. One of them um, is in, still in discussion and the other one's going to be a very exciting after hours um, event that won't be recorded. So we're really <laughs> looking forward to that one as well. It'll be a little bit silly. Ch Chaz my house rules. So um, I hope to see you at um, another NV event online on Zoom. because <laughs> That's where we are these days. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.